Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Meg Olson, and I am the Grassroots Mobilization Network Director here at Network. We're so glad that you can join us today for this important webinar. Our webinar today is Faithful Recovery, and we'll be talking about the American Jobs and the American Families Plan. I am joined here today by my colleagues from the grassroots or the government relations team, our chief lobby, lobbyist, Laura Peralta Schulte, Gina Kelly, our government relations associate, and Jared Smith, our government relations fellow. I'd also like to thank my colleagues on the grassroots mobilization team, Catherine Gillette and Colin Longmore for uh, helping out with tech today. So before we begin, I just wanna go over a few Zoom etiquette pieces. Um, first of all, we do have closed captions available if you need them. They are auto-generated, so they're not perfect, but um, again, they are there uh, to help you out if you need them. And um, we will have a Q&A portion uh, during this webinar and we ask that you type your questions about policy um, into the Q&A box. That way we have your name and your email. And so if we need to follow up with you, it'll be very easy to do that. So today we're gonna talk about the President's American Jobs and Families Plan. Um, Sherrit and Gina and Laura will outline networks priorities in this piece of legislation. And we'll talk about what you can do to help us during this important time. Um, this plan, these plans fit in so well to our build a new agenda. And we know that the time is now to be big and bold and comprehensive to build our nation anew. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Jarrett to talk about the current state of play. Thank you, Meg. Thank you for getting us started this afternoon. This is a very important webinar, like Meg said. Uh, on the government relations team, my portfolio includes broadband, uh, housing, and HR 40. This afternoon, I'll talk to you about broadband and housing. So we'll start with the current state of play. President Biden and a bipartisan group of Senate moderates are negotiating a small traditional infrastructure bill. This is what you would call hard in infrastructure. Whether you live in a big city or, or a small town, we're talking roads, your bridges, um, that basic infrastructure. No current agreement on scope of the bill or funding has been decided. The White House is signaling negotiations may and if an agreement is not reached very soon, and we're already in June. Network's priority in current bipartisan bill is expansion of broadband. We would love to see broadband uh, in every home in this country. Next slide, please. So the Build Back Agenda. We're talking about the American jobs and the American families plan. President Biden has come up with a very bold vision. And this would transform communities and individuals all over our country. Uh, leadership and most Democrats are on board with this proposal. But we need your help pushing moderates to know, to understand that this is the time to go big. And as many of you probably know, Republicans oppose both plans. We have two potential paths forward. The first one, bipartisan discussions continue throughout this month and a more realistic possibility by partisan discussions in some time in June. President Biden and Democrats huddle in Congress and move to budget reconciliation. So let's talk about the housing proposal. 
that the president gave us last month. This is really, really impressive. We haven't seen this in a generation. And all these proposals that you see on the screen, if, if you notice, they end with a B. That's billions of dollars. That will touch everybody in this country. We're talking about 40 billion in public housing, 20 billion, billion in neighborhood home investment, 126 billion electrifying housing units, uh, investment in energy efficiency through block grants, weatherizing and tax credits. But here at Network, we want to see more. We think the American public deserves more. So we want universal housing vouchers to be added to this infrastructure plan. If you are really going to achieve affordable housing in this country, housing vouchers are probably the easiest, most effective way to make that happen. And that is not just for uh, the lowest uh, on the income, uh, income scale, but even middle-class families are having very difficult times trying to meet their housing obligations. We'd also like to see public housing investment go from currently what the president has proposed to $70 billion. And yes, broadband. The president proposed a hundred billion dollar investment in broadband. He would like to see 100% of the country uh, covered by broadband. And that is a, a, a great aspiration. He wants to enlist local government, nonprofits, and co ops to build broadband communities. He wants to provide set asides for our tribal brothers and sisters in various initiatives. He wants to provide transparency, and this is very important for internet providers. We should all be able to understand that what we're paying for and whether you have one provider or another provider, you're getting the same level of service and paying the same monthly rate. And he wants to reduce internet prices instead of subsidizing overpriced providers. And so what would, broad, or what would network like to see in the broadband proposal? Well, we would like to see guaranteed service everywhere in the country, whether you live in rural America or the urban centers, you should have access to true broadband service. We want to make the broadband subsidy that's in the ARPA Act, we want to make that permanent. So if you can't afford broadband, that should not decide whether or not you get this very important uh, access to this very important almost utility at this point in this country. And we want to empower the Federal Communications Commission to regulate where and when broadband is deployed. So those communities that do not have it, they should have some way by the means of the federal government to get them comparable broadband service to wealthier parts uh, in their community. Thank you so much, Jared, for giving us the overview of this massive uh, once in a generation legislation and walking us through housing and broadband. Thank you, Meg. I'm now gonna pass it over to Gina to talk about jobs and worker development and other labor issues. Thank you, Meg, and thank you, Jarrett. I'm so excited to be with everyone today. Um, so we are gonna start off by talking about President Biden's investment in jobs and worker development and what that could look like for communities across the country. So first, it's a $100 billion investment, um, and that's no small number to laugh at. This could really transform communities, and I and my team and every one of you, I'm sure, are so excited to see this. Um, so examples of what this investment could look like include apprenticeship programs for women and people of color, career path programs implemented into middle and high schools, and partnerships with community colleges and other higher education institutions. 
And this also includes investments in labor enforcement programs that ensure our workers are safe and healthy while on the job. Um, additionally, another program that we are so excited about is that the administration has proposed focused job training for formerly incarcerated folks and justice involved youth, which is such a huge and critical step to um, creating a racially just and equitable economy. Um, and so networks priority is to ensure that these investments have racially equitable outcomes. So we can invest, but we wanna make sure that the end result um, is just as equitable as possible. Um, so this means that ensuring that these jobs that are gonna be created from these programs and these investments go to communities of color and that these jobs you know, have good wages, solid benefits, and the choice to unionize if they can. Um, during the 2009 recovery, communities of color took much longer to recover than their white counterparts, and we cannot allow history to repeat itself here. Um, recovery is only real recovery if everyone is given a fair shot. Um, and then additionally, um, this package, as we noted, is most likely going to go through reconciliation, which means it's a Democrat-only process, and it's really limited um, in what it's allowed to do, because it's sort of a weird Senate procedural process to pass a bill. Um, and so because of that, we know that the, a raise in the minimum wage probably won't happen. Um, and so we would like to encourage the administration to ensure that people um, contracted, you know, when the administration contracts with companies, um, that they ensure that those jobs are paying at least $15 an hour um, at the minimum. Because, you know, we know that people cannot live on the current minimum wage or the sub-minimum wages that exist in this country. Um, and we wanna ensure that the government isn't allowing people to live on poverty wages. So that's another addition we'd love to see. Um, and so while talking about good wages and you know, creating a just workforce, um, I'm so excited to talk about the Protecting the Right to Organize Act or the PRO Act. Um, President Biden has explicitly asked for the PRO Act to be passed in the American Jobs Plan. And he also specifically talked about it in his recent address to the nation. Um, we are so excited to have an administration that understands the necessity and the power of unions. So the PRO Act protects the basic right to join a union by doing a couple of things. First, by introducing meaningful and enforceable penalties for companies that violate workers' rights. Second, by expanding collective bargaining rights and closing existing loopholes in legislation that currently exists. And third, by strengthening workers' access to fair union elections and requiring corporations to respect this result. That third one is so important, um, especially as we've seen in the last couple of months with Amazon workers trying to unionize and the, the tactics Amazon has used to force, to you know, sway an election. And this legislation would do incredible work to ensure that that doesn't happen. And the PRO Act isn't just great for workers, which it is, but it makes the economy work for working people. We know that when union membership is greater, wages are better. Um, this bill is also more than just labor reform, it's civil rights legislation. A union contract is one of the best tools we have to close racial and gender wage and wealth gaps. And it also ensures the dignity of the worker and gives due process to workers, regardless of where they are born, who they are, or what industry they work in. Removing barriers to organizing and bargaining is important for all workers, especially those who have been marginalized. Expanding collective bargaining increases protections for women, immigrants, and the LGBTQ plus community in areas where our current law is just falling short. And aside from all of that that I just threw at you, unions are popular. Research shows that 60 million workers would vote to join a union today if given the opportunity. And union approval stands at around 65%, which is one of the highest it's ever been at. So this critical legislation with all these wonderful things that I've talked about has passed the House which is so exciting, but now it's stuck in the Senate. Um, and so the president's inclusion of this bill in his uh, package shows just how important it is to our collective recovery. And we're so excited to work together to see this to President Biden's desk. And so next, what we're gonna talk about is, you know, we talk about good benefits and how unions can help you get them. One of the biggest benefits that we would love to see um, happen is paid leave. And so many workers in the U.S. lack paid leave. Um, and paid leave, wonderfully, is a huge part of President Biden's American Families Plan proposal. So as it is currently outlined, this proposal guarantees 12 weeks of paid leave over a 10-year period. 
And so we don't know what those increments will look like or how long, you know, what year we'll get to certain um, amounts of weeks paid. But we do know by 10 years after it's passed, we will have 12 weeks of paid leave. Um, we also know that it includes progressive wage replacement, which is so exciting and so critically important. So what progressive wage replacement means is that um, you're giving low-income workers the most income possible and kind of working your way down from there while providing a minimum. So you're giving the people who need the most help the most help and working your way down from there, which is really ideal for this kind of program. Um, and so this is family and medical leave, so kind of emergency things. Um, we have an existing sick leave act, which President Biden has also passed Congress about, called the Healthy Families Act, um, which provides guarantee sick time to workers, which is just as important. Um, so while this is a great outline, it is kind of bare bones currently. And so Network has some ideas of what we would like to see filled in and what we really need to see implemented in order to make this a full proposal. So first, there's no job protection or anti-retaliation language within this outline. And this is so critical to making sure it is implemented equitably. Research from current state, federal, pay, state programs um, show that workers of color, particularly low-income workers of color, are less likely to take paid leave if they do not have job protection. Strong anti-discrimination and anti-retaliation language and enforcement are needed to make paid leave fully accessible. Um, we also need the broadest eligibility possible. Um, so when we talk about eligibility, we want to make sure as many workers, including self-employed workers or contingent workers or gig workers are included because everyone at one point in their life is going to need to take paid leave. Um, and so, uh, so I've kind of mentioned implementation thus far, but once again, we really want to see a strong focus invested in equitable implementation plan. Um, research on current state programs finds that workers of color are less likely to be aware of programs, the benefits they provide, and how to apply. So this makes creating dedicated funding for outreach, education, and enforcement so important to ensure that these are, you know, equitable programs that reach all the people that they are designed to reach. Um, and so finally, I have one last thing to note before I will pass it over um, to one of my wonderful colleagues, and that's nutrition. So um, there are two really exciting parts of President Biden's nutrition proposal. Um, the first being that uh, individuals with drug-related felonies would now be able to access SNAP benefits, which is such an incredible step forward in the mission of racial equity and creating real reforms in our system. Um, and secondly, this includes a massive expansion of summer EDP, which helps get children food over the summer when they would normally have access to programs through their schools that would provide them with food. Um, and this, you know, children experience such a high rate of food insecurity over the summer when they don't have those school programs and this really bridges that gap and would be such a big step to ensuring no child in this country is hungry. Um, and before I allow Meg to pass it over, um, I wanted to give a quick thank you to Mara on the government relations team who works on nutrition and racial equity issues for us. And she just does such incredible work in this area. Um, so thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Gina. I know we're all so excited about the PRO Act and paid family leave. They're issues that Network's been working on for a long time um, and the nutrition um, for sure. And thank you to Sister Mara Rutten for also working on this issue. Now I'm going to hand it over to Laura, who's going to talk to us about healthcare and then taxes. So I get to talk about two of my favorite topics and I hope two of your favorite topics. And I just wanna begin by thanking uh, Meg and her team for uh, putting this uh, event on today and for Jared and Marit, uh, uh, Mara uh, and Gina uh, who have uh, really got us to a place where we, we are ready to uh, tell you what's, on, what's going on and, and enlist your strong support. So, uh, I just want to start out in terms of healthcare, just to recognize that the um, the rescue plan, the American Rescue Plan, that passed earlier this year, was actually the largest expansion of healthcare since the Affordable Care Act. Um, you will recall, or you may recall, that in that bill there was the first time um, premiums. For, uh, for families who were kind of falling in a gap 
who were not uh, um, uh, uh, poor enough to get subsidies, but but couldn't actually afford their health care. So uh, it had those uh, premium tax credits that make health care affordable. It had significant money in there for maternal health, particularly black and brown maternal health, where you have outcomes that are simply unacceptable in the wealthiest nation in the world that you have black moms uh, uh, and brown moms dying uh, at childbirth. So that was very, very good news on the healthcare front. Um, and, uh, and so what we wanna do in healthcare is really build on that. Um, another piece of the American uh, uh, re rescue plan was a expansion of subsidies to states to try to encourage them to expand Medicare. But uh, my friends, particularly those of you who may be watching from Texas or Florida or uh, the latest really in Missouri, um, of states that have not extended Medicaid, um, hopefully we'll get one or two of them. Um, I'm looking at you, Jane Adams, if you were on here watching uh, in Alabama, hopefully um, at least a few states will move forward to expand Medicaid with the new supports in the American uh, Rescue Plan. But we know for sure that many of them will not. And so one of our priorities in the healthcare space is to finally close that Medicare gap for the 2.2 million people living below the poverty line in the 12 states that will refuse or have refused to expand uh, Medicaid. So we need to make sure we're not leaving a pandemic where many of these communities are precisely the ones that suffered the highest death rates and the highest uh, 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 problem in health outcomes. We're not gonna leave anybody behind and we wanna prioritize making sure that folks all over the country have coverage. How do we do that? Um, you know, if you could turn to the next slide, you will see that there are, we are not gonna be prescriptive on the Hill in terms of the way that we call for closure. That is because, uh, you know, there is currently a disagreement um, between uh, leaders in Congress, uh, particularly on the House side, as to how to move forward. I think we are at the position, uh, we at Network, and hopefully uh, um, you as you are making your meetings, you know, the outcome is what we're looking for. And so whether or not um, there is a new federal program, federal Medicaid program uh, uh, set up by the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid uh, that will allow people to get coverage for the first time, or whether people will get fully subsidized coverage through the ACA marketplace, that is gonna be made at a very high level uh, uh, and really beyond our control to impact. Our mission is to make sure that Congress hears from Network and our partners loud and clear that nobody should leave a pandemic without the guarantee of coverage. Moving on, um, there are some other key priorities in the healthcare space. Uh, very aligned to the concept of making sure nobody leaves the pandemic without healthcare. One is with respect to the uh, Medicaid funding gap in the US territories. Um, and so we just wanna make sure that when we talk about who gets coverage under Medicaid in the, uh, in the bill that just passed this year, there was temporary funding for Medicaid in the US territories, think Puerto Rico and others. But that runs out in September. So we don't want to be in a situation where folks are using health care, uh, their health coverage. So we want to make sure we close the gap in Medicaid funding for territories. Um, I want to lift up the work of Joan uh, uh, on our team and Mara as well in terms of bringing to the attention the lack of uh, health coverage for folks who are incarcerated, particularly folks who are leaving incarceration. We wanna make sure that, um, uh, that there is a federal program to begin folks uh, who are currently incarcerated and leaving in 30 days. We wanna make sure that people get Medicaid access then 
so that when they are released, they are they have care. Uh, they uh, that is not something that they are going to need to worry about, and that they can go and move forward uh, in in security. I think the last issues that we want to make sure, uh, and these are a big push. Uh, uh, so just to, to ready everybody, the last issues in healthcare that we're really fighting for is uh, first healthcare for our immigrant. Uh, sisters and brothers. So there is an irony that is uh, present throughout the entire COVID uh, pandemic that so often the first responders, the doctors, the nurses uh, who have been providing services are, are um, immigrant uh, uh, from immigrant families, either DACA or TPS. Federal rules uh, that are not related to healthcare specifically, but related to immigration, federal rules block access to healthcare. Uh, there's a five-year bar um, uh, for access to healthcare for folks who have green cards. And so we want to make sure that for the first time um, that immigrants, uh, since the 96 bill, when they, they, those, that access was taken away, that we make sure that uh, legally present immigrants have access to, to Medicaid and have access to CHIP. Finally, we do know uh, that these bills are gonna have to be paid for. That is a polit political dynamic that is very much in play. Um, so currently the thinking is, and this was in the president's budget and in his plans, that the way that we will pay for these expansions in healthcare is through um, uh, giving Medicare the ability to negotiate drug prices uh, uh, with the companies, which is a significant cost savings. I'm gonna flip a hat now and turn to uh, one of uh, another favorite topic of mine, which is taxes. Uh, not everybody can say that, but for me, I love it. Um, and uh, we were thrilled in the president's uh, and the American uh, Rescue Plan that for the first time, we had huge expansions in both the child tax credit and in the earned income tax credit. They were modified so significantly in terms of who could access and full refundability uh, uh, on the child tax credit and on the EITC, for the first time, they were available uh, to folks without kids living in their home. Um, so those were huge, uh, very big wins for us in that last package. And our goal in this time is to make sure that it's not just a short-term expansion, but that we lock these credits in permanently. We are talking about millions and millions of people who will get specific relief through these tax credits. These are some of the most effective anti-poverty programs uh, that we have currently. Um, it related to that are the issues of um, eligibility on the child tax credit uh, uh, for uh, children who have an ITIN number rather than a, a social security number. And an ITIN number is just a, 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 a number given by uh, the IRS that you can file taxes uh, through uh, when you do not have a social security number. This was law of the land, my friends, before President Trump and the Republicans passed the 2017 bill. Uh, children with ITINs did have access to the child tax credit. So we wanna make sure that Congress hears loud and clear from us that as we are repealing some of the, the tax benefits that went to the wealthiest among us, that we are making sure that immigrant families are able to, particularly immigrant children, are able to receive this new improved child tax credit, which as of July, uh, uh, taxpayers will have the option to get a monthly child tax credit as opposed to just a, uh, a, a lump sum at the end of the year. We'll be back to you on implementation because we really do need to make sure that all the families you all are working with have information to file to start getting 
uh, a, a, um, a monthly check. So two priorities, big time, making permanent the, the expansion of the child tax credit, making them uh, inclusive, as well as making sure that the earned income tax credit is permanent. Again, we come to the issue because we're likely to be using what Gina talked about as the budget, the, the DEM only budget reconciliation process. Um, we know that things have to be paid for. And so we really want to show great gratitude for President Biden, one, to be willing to talk about raising taxes uh, and really using the mantra that we've been using since 2017, which is everybody needs to pay their fair share. And we know that that 2017 bill gave $2 trillion worth of tax credits to big corporations and to the wealthiest among us. Um, uh, one provision uh, we uh, lovingly called the Trump tax credit because it was specifically uh, uh, benefiting many of his real estate businesses. So the job right now, particularly because we are being told that we've got to pay for a permanent child tax credit, expansions in healthcare, uh, the housing provisions that Jared talked about, the, the paid leave that Gina talked about, we need to be aggressive and remind Congress that it is right and just for the wealthy and corporations to pay their fair share. So what do I mean by that? Um, in the 2017 bill, there was a provision that, uh, that allows big multinational corporations uh, to have a lower tax rate on what they uh, produce overseas than what they produce in the United States of America. Not only is that bad tax policy, but it's, it really hurts US workers who are uh, uh, often in competition for jobs. So we believe that the tax code should be neutral as it relates to where companies make decisions to invest and that it should not be an incentive to put jobs overseas. Uh, secondly, that 2017 bill dropped the corporate rate if four points lower than corporations were asking. They were asking in the debate for a 25% corporate tax rate. Um, Trump went down to 21. We want to grab back that money uh, and make sure that, um, that corporations are not paying zero like Netflix, like Amazon, and others who are making a bundle of money and not contributing their fair share. Uh, likewise, related, you know, there are uh, all kinds of special tax loopholes that allow profitable corporations not to pay taxes. So we are, I won't go into the nitty gritty, but there are a number of provisions that um, went in through the 2017 bill that we are trying to pull out. Likewise, there were quite a few uh, loopholes that were created in 2017. And frankly, there were loopholes prior to that that allow uh, the wealthy to pay both a lower rate on investment uh, profits than workers and have all kinds of tax benefits that allow them to avoid paying their fair share. Uh, just to, to name uh, one more, uh, eliminating the loophole that allows the wealthy to avoid paying taxes on profits from the assets they inherit. Some of you may hear that and, and uh, be concerned about family farmers or, or uh, you know, small business folks. We are working with members of Congress right now to uh, ensure that if it is a small farmer, uh, a small uh, a farm family, if it is a certain circumstance, then there could be very well justification for not making it full cloth. What we wanna really do is make sure that, that uh, the IRS is getting money from the big folks uh, who are hiding behind the small farmers to shield millions and frankly, billions of dollars from taxation. Uh, one of the most promising ways that we're also looking at raising revenue, frankly, is strictly through enforcement. Um, you know, the, the strategy for a long time, uh, um, uh, particularly by the Republican Party, has been to starve the IRS 
of resources. It's really expensive to go after large corporations. It's really expensive to have the woman power or the man power to go after super wealthy folks because they lawyer up. So what we wanna make sure is that there is adequate money in the IRS budget so that they can target uh, uh, tax avoidance by folks who are very sophisticated and who are dodging taxes. Right now, the, the IRS over audits from our estimation, uh, those folks getting child tax credits in the EITC uh, because they're easy to do. Uh, so what we wanna make sure is that the IRS has the resources to go where the money is. Uh, finally, before we go into our ask, let, let us be real about the challenges ahead. Um, and the first one I just wanna name follows up on what we were just saying, revenue. You, um, very few members, be you Republican or Democrat, really like to uh, raise taxes on constituents. And it is, I just want to uh, let folks know that raising uh, tax, that when you look at Biden's proposals, he is, he is already committed to not raising money, uh, any taxes on people that make $400,000 or less. And in fact, when you look at the specific proposals that he has teed up, um, he, we are really targeting, he is really targeting the ultra wealthy um, and those corporations like Amazon and Netflix who are paying zero. So uh, if you look at polls, it's really uh, uh, such a, a wonderful thing to see because you will see that the bipartisan support, even in Fox polls, by independents and Republicans is plus 50. It's 60% Republicans in the latest Fox poll uh, said they support raising taxes on the rich and corporations. So, so uh, it, it does not make it easier for uh, some Democrats to, uh, to entertain raising taxes. Uh, but the polling is clear um, that there is appetite uh, and we just have to push to make sure folks remember that, that the $2 trillion that was given away in 2017 needs to be grabbed back. Um, the only other issue that is just kind of up in the air from a process side is we're still not clear how much uh, of the bill can be deficit financed as opposed to paid for. Uh, in terms of the next slide, that's fine. Um, it is uh, clear that uh, drug pricing uh, is and will continue to be a sticky uh, subject. Uh, I just saw uh, uh, today an article from CNBC that there is uh, the second large investment by pharma to try to block uh, uh, justice uh, uh, in terms of uh, plans to uh, in the Medicare space and in the COVID space. Uh, they are well resourced uh, and, and they're throwing down a lot of uh, hard earned money to, to feed these uh, proposals. We've got justice on our side, we've got consumers on our side, and particularly if we're going to have to pay for these packages, we need to make sure this one is in. Finally, I just would uh, not be fair uh, to say that we will need your help as it relates to uh, immigration issues uh, that we are trying to get included into any package. And I really wanna lift up the work of my colleague, Renette, who leads on the immigration issues, uh, because what our goal is in this package is to see if there's any possibility to use this as a way to do some, do some good work that we can't do in other spaces. So again, I already said that we are trying to ensure that uh, um, immigrant kids have access and their parents have access to the child tax credit. Uh, I've already indicated that uh, we are trying to make sure that healthcare uh, it comes to uh, permanent residence and that that is just part of being uh, in America and, and being committed to, uh, to residency. So lifting that five-year bar Finally, I just want to flag for you 
that we are also looking to see uh, whether or not we can include green cards in this upcoming package. Uh, um, so again, we talked about this, this really uh, very complicated process called budget reconciliation. There's an empire in budget reconciliation and she is the Senate parliamentarian. So we are awaiting a decision in terms of whether or not green cards can be included for essential workers in this bill. The political ask, if, we, if, if the empire says, yes, it can, we're gonna push hard to make sure that green cards are in there for TPS holders, for DACA, uh, for DACA folks, and for anybody we can get in there. That will be a big ask for us. Uh, Meg, I think I've, I've gone on probably longer than my time. So uh, I am happy to turn it over to you and, and uh, take any questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Jarrett, Gina, and Laura for walking us through this huge piece of legislation um, that we're so excited about that we know we have to be big and bold. Um, we do have quite a few questions. Um, so um, I'm going to be fielding these to uh, to various folks based on the topic to all to our panelists. Um, and for those of you who've submitted questions, if we do run out of time, um, we do have your email. And so I'll make sure that you get a response in a timely manner to uh, your question that you proposed. All right. So, um, okay, let's start with this one and we'll talk more about this at the end, but uh, as acknowledged throughout, uh, this is a huge piece of legislation with so many parts. And so we have a member wondering, uh, they're one of our members and our strong advocates, what should they focus on? What is their message to their senators? And they're in a state where they have one Democrat and one Republican. So um, if the three of you want to turn your cameras on, and uh, I don't know who wants to take a crack at this, but what should this person, I'm sure this applies to so many of our viewers and definitely a lot of our members. So thoughts on this question. Meg, I think the first issue that we really want to raise, and, and I know you're going to be saying this at the end of the slide, is, uh, is really go big, go big. Because um, uh, as, as Jarrett was indicating earlier, we know that particularly with these bipartisan discussions, that's a tiny little bill, a, a tiny relative to the, to the uh, human infrastructure and the larger infrastructure we outlined for you. And my, my biggest concern, frankly, is that they get this little tiny bill and, and the political will is gone. Um, so I would just say that in this timeline, we want to give them uh, room to go big, go bold. The reality is, is we, we probably have what, what we got, six months to get something done before election processes start taking place. And, and, and how many times in a decade do you control the White House and, and the two branches of Congress? So, so we don't want to we don't want to lose this time uh, uh, and by by piddling on the on the uh, on the margins. We need to go big or or go home. And, and I would add, uh, Meg, thank you for the question. That you know the, this is a legacy moment. You know when when, when members want to talk to representatives and our, and senators, but they should stress that you know. I mean, this is going to be written in history books. You know, this is an opportunity to do something that will change the trajectory of this country forever for the positive. And so where do they want to stand on that? And, you know, we, we think that they should support it because this is something that will help each and every American throughout the land. Wonderful. Gina, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I will just add that I'll add a few things. So first, I want to add that, yes, it's important to emphasize that we go big. But one thing, Laura sort of touched on this, but I want to make it more clear that 
we don't want people to leave behind the things that aren't traditionally seen as infrastructure. Those things are just as important and they're so core to that vision of going bold. Like paid leave has to be in here and I'm partial to that because it's my issue, but it has to be in there. Um, and then secondly, I think this bill is a really great first step towards creating a racially equitable country. You know, this bill has a ton of first steps and a ton of provisions that, you know, really take a step towards that vision. Um, and HR 40 is such a huge part of that reparations. Um, and while that's not in this bill, this is, you know, just, it's right up there. We have to have these conversations and we have to create systems that actually work for everyone. Um, so yeah, go big, go bold um, and include everything, include everyone. And thank you, Gina, for mentioning HR 40. I appreciate it. Of course. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks everyone. All right, so um, Jarrett, you talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but someone wants to know, what is the status of the negotiations to fashion this bipartisan bill? Um, well, th this, um, and this person also heard, as we know, that the Biden administration is willing to cut $550 billion from the proposal. Yes, um, the, the, those, th that, that's true. Uh, the Republicans have come back uh, with an alternative proposal. But the problem uh, that I believe the White House sees in it, it is not investing in all the priorities that the president has, right? The president thinks there should be investment in housing. There, there's an investment in housing. The president would like to see investment in broadband. There isn't investment in broadband. And uh, like my colleague Gina said, you know, soft infrastructure isn't even discussed by the, the Republicans. So yes, the Republicans have brought a proposal forward, but you got to ask yourself if you're in the West Wing in the White House, is that the legacy that the president wants to establish, right? Because this is the president's first big bill uh, that he has 100% control that is not COVID related, so to speak, right? So, you know, by doing the bill that he initially proposed with hard and soft infrastructure, that is something that I think President Biden has considered for, you know, many years, you know, that he's thought about how do we really fix these problems? And this is, you know, one way to do it. What the pre pre Republicans are proposing, are not gonna get us close, right? I mean, we're not just talking about what's going on here in our country, but this is making us competitive with the rest of the world. And if we don't make these investments, and these are investments in ourselves, right? Yeah. You know, we're investing in, you know, small town Iowa, we're investing in big city New York, we're investing in everybody. If we don't do that, then, I don't know what our our future holds because you know th this is it you know and um, the the president I think you know is seriously you know talking to Republican leadership and and the Republican senators that are are pushing this proposal and I think they're all going to have to come to a point where you know the president can't go any for go any further discussing this with them. And he's going to have to huddle with uh, Democrat leadership and move this forward. Thanks, Jarrett. Uh, Laura, or and maybe Jarrett, you could answer this as well. There's a, a part three to this question about uh, the Democrat, about the White House administration, the Democrat, and the Republican difference on funding. This idea of user fees versus raising taxes. So I don't know who wants to comment on this. Laura, Jared, do you want to go first? <laughs> I, I would just say, you know, um, user fees, I think for a lot of Democrats are a non-starter. You know, I mean, if you really look at some of the policies that the last administration proposed, like this huge tax cut, there wasn't talk about or serious talk about how do we pay for it? <laughs> I mean, Republicans said we are in power this is what our guy wants, so we're gonna do this. I think that should be the same process that the President, President Biden should take with this infrastructure bill. 
Now, I'm not saying that we don't look for pay force, right? I'm not saying that we don't unwind the tax cut, but this idea of user fees that I think historically hurt middle class and lower income folks more than anybody else, uh, I think it's just a non-starter. It's, it's, it's a rhetoric that is clouding um, the, the negotiations, the conversation on uh, actually trying to move an infrastructure bill forward. I would, I would just concur with that, Meg. And, you know, I, I think where the rubber really hits the road is that, um, you know, I, 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 it'll, I, it will be hard pressed to find the revenue outside of user fees, um, uh, of which as Jerk correctly says, the Democrats have some problem with, at least some, most of them do. Um, uh, and so the question then because comes, do you deficit finance them? Uh, or, or uh, you know, does that cause the demise of the bipartisan efforts? I, I mean, there, this is really a we'll have to see moment. Um, I, I, I am just concerned because of the clock. And what I mean by that is that, you know, here we are in June, you know, there have been plenty of times where these bipartisan negotiations go nowhere but take months. And I'm thinking back even back to the Affordable Care Act discussions where uh, we negotiated against ourselves taking out a public option, <laughs> still didn't get a, you know, at some point you got a fish or cut bait as the president said over the weekend, or I think it was Pete Buttigieg and, and, and get to the act of legislating. So I think we're nearing that and, and we'll just have to see how, how it goes. There is plenty of revenue uh, uh, junk in the uh, in the tax code that we could pull out to pay for this if, if that's the if that's the mission at hand. Thanks so much, Jared and Laura. Um, so this continuing on the conversation about financing, um, you know, Laura, thank you for walking us through all the possibilities of who we can tax and how. Um, but wondering, taxing corporations and the wealthiest, does this come while the bills are in process or after? Does the funding accompany the different bills? Um, how is this pulled off? <laughs> so so, uh, so this is, uh, and I really appreciate that people are saying like, these are very comprehensive bills and complicated, but friends, I just wanna give you confidence. You have done this before <laughs> because <laughs> at the American Rescue Plan, if you looked at the four or five bills we passed last year, this, this, we've been going big in this context. So do you have confidence that these things come together? They just come together uh, uh, in um, kind of a different way than standalone bills. So the, um, in terms of uh, Meg, the, uh, what happens under budget reconciliation uh, is that each of the whatever the committees uh, have a piece of it will be given a number and they will need to raise revenue to meet the revenue need. Um, under reconciliation, if something is permanent, it's got to be paid for permanently. So, so what that means in terms of the revenue pieces, we're really talking about two committees. Uh, in the House, it is the Ways and Means Committee. Shout out to anybody in Massachusetts because your uh, your Mr. Neal is going to be front and center like he was before, and we need you. Uh, and uh, on the other side, on the Senate side, it's going to be Senator Wyden. So, uh, so those of you in the greater uh, Northwest, uh, in the great state of of Oregon, we need you he's gonna be the key decision maker with leadership. So these will be very top down, top down heavy bills. Uh, they will be very leadership driven, uh, but I, I wanna give you confidence. We can get this stuff. We just have to work and we have to work smart. So our goal is to provide you with information so we can give direction to what the message is and who we need to talk to at what time. Great, thanks so much. And yes, I just, there are a few people wondering like, you know, are we gonna get updates and how are we gonna hear about all these bills and the status of these different components? Um, and yes, we are in the process of creating a landing page for this bill with all of the resources you're gonna need. Um, so that is definitely happening. 
We have time for one more question. And for those of you who submitted such thoughtful questions, um, I just want to um, assure you that we will respond in email to these um, by, you know, within one week. But um, so, uh, you know, you talked a lot about just Laura about the moderates um, and kind of their hesitations. But um, so what aspects of this legislation are most at risk of being excluded? I, 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 and I, I want to give a shout out to Sister Emily, who I, I think most of you probably know, and Colin, who is mm -hmm. on the webinar right now. Um, personally, I think it is the pay fors that are the most difficult. Uh, and what I mean by that, uh, and we, I said it earlier, you know, oftentimes you're talking about taxing your donors. I think we've got to be real. Um, uh, even if it's good tax policy, many of those members run in very fancy circles, and this is who they go to fundraisers with. So that is the political reality uh, we are dealing with. Um, so I would just say that uh, making sure that we support the president in trying to keep those revenue pieces in there, making sure that we press on both the tax and the drug pricing stuff to pay for healthcare supports. We will get as much as we get by if, if we are required to pay for this. And it's the moderates that are saying they don't wanna increase the deficit. So I just wanna put it on kind of on them. We need to make sure there's adequate revenue to pay for the investments that Jared and Gina have and, and, and I have laid out. It, if we get those that revenue, they can figure out how to spend it, but it's the revenue piece that is disproportionately important. And the reason I raised Emily at the beginning is she has like so deep into the tax code in, in what is an awesome workshop. So, so if you really are as excited about taxes as Emily, Colin and I, I just wanna put a plug in Meg to your teammate, pulling that out, because that is some kind of beauty. Thanks, Laura. And I, we have quite a few people on here who have already attended the workshop and are saying, don't forget to mention the workshop. So I really appreciate our, our members' support of that workshop. And yes, definitely we'll be having, we're having one tomorrow, but then we're having, we're going to continue to have them in late June and July. So stay tuned for that. So moving into our call to action for today. Um, well, uh, for this webinar, um, on Friday, so two days from today, we are having a call-in day. So if you get our action alerts, which I'm pretty sure you do because you received the invitation to this webinar, you are going to be getting an email or a text if you are signed up for our texting program um, to call your senators and ask them to support President Biden's economic plan. And this call-in is with all of our faith partners from the domestic human needs. So it'll be us and the Friends Committee on National Legislation and the Episcopalians and the Lutherans and um, our friends over at um, the Relig uh, Religious Action Center for Reform Judaism. So we're really gonna have a huge faith day. And the ask on Friday is fairly simple. We're asking our senators to support this robust public investment in all of these issues that Jarrett, Gina, and Laura laid out, housing, paid family and medical leave, healthcare, broadband. We want to make sure that it's in this year's federal budget. And we want to emphasize that it is economically, racially, and environmentally just. Um, really making sure, as Gina so have continued to emphasize throughout, that this bill that this legislation um, addresses, you know, advances racial equity and racial justice in our country. And yes, we will definitely later uh, this, um, you know, this summer, late June, early July, we will be um, asking you to go on lobby visits. And um, we're really gonna be paying attention as Laura and everyone else pointed out, the moderates, our, squish, our squishy middle uh, Democrats are gonna need your support. So, um, so we'll definitely be asking you 
uh, for your support there, and then definitely with some other uh, Senate legislative targets. So uh, stay tuned for that as well. And I did see that one of my colleagues put into the chat the information on tomorrow's tax justice workshop, unveiling the, the racism in the tax code. Um, and so there's lots to do. And just um, one final piece, um, hopefully, you know, um, you are getting our emails, but um, so definitely stay connected. You can sign up and double check at networklobby.org. You can always email info at, at Network Lobby and, um, you know, Colin, uh, my colleague, will uh, is great at responding, at fielding those questions and getting your questions to the right person. And then, of course, we're all over social media on Facebook, Twitter, and now Instagram. So if you're not on Instagram, but you might have a younger niece or nephew or daughter or granddaughter, or, you know, uh, have them follow us. We have a lot of great content that um, that really explains this legislation and different issues that we're working on in, in that very short, uh, sassy social media form. So once again, thank you so much to uh, Jarrett, Gina, and Laura for sharing all of your wisdom and helping lay out this uh, robust legislation. Uh, we just want to make sure, if, if nothing else, you will get this recording and these slides in your email. So, um, and you know, feel free to share that information as well with um, your friends and, and colleagues um, to keep, to keep this uh, education going. But um, if nothing else for today, we want it, We know we want to go big and bold and build a new nation. So thank you.